Almighty God, we come to you and we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity that we have, the freedom that we have to come into this place and worship you and learn more about you through your word. And Lord, that's what we pray this morning is that you would teach us, that you would help us to grow in you, in knowledge, in faith. Lord, that we could grow closer to you by worshiping you and hearing your word. And so we lay our minds and our hearts at your feet this morning and pray that that's what you would do, that you would teach us, mold us to become more like you. We thank you again and we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our amazing Lord and Savior. Amen. You can be seated and as you're taking a seat, grab your Bible, your mobile app, whatever you've got your Bible on, and turn to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Um, If you don't have a Bible, feel free to use one of them that's in the pew. And if you don't have a Bible at home, take that Bible out of the pew and take it home with you. Um, We want everybody to have Bibles in their homes that they can read and study throughout the week. So those are free. Take them with you if you don't have one. We want you to have it. Um, Let me ask you a question. Have any of you ever done what's called people watching? You know what I'm talking about? My wife and I love to go people watch. Um, And I don't know if that's wrong, uh, that we love to do this so much, but I've got a relative, I'm not going to say who it is, who loves to go shopping, and and this relative can literally go into every store in a mall and spend 30 minutes in every single one and not buy a thing. I don't know how she manages to do that or how she's wired that makes her capable of this, but she loves to do that. And so when my wife and I are with her, we sit on a bench and just let her go. And while we're sitting on the bench, we'll watch the people go by. And as they're walking around, we make up stories or we try and figure out what they do, how many kids they've got, if they've got grandkids. So we speculate. We do a lot of speculating. And again, is that wrong that... Of course it's not wrong. All of you do it too. <laughs> so No, it's not wrong. I, no, no, please move on. Um, but we love to do this. So, so we, we sit and we, we watch people and we, we kind of laugh and joke about so I know that's probably wrong. But, <laughs> but, but we, it's entertaining to sit and watch people walk by. And as I was developing the sermon, I, I was thinking about it and I thought, I wonder what people think of me and my wife as we walk by. You know, the people that are at the mall and sitting on the benches and doing what I'm always doing, I wonder what they think. You know, do they look at my wife and I and go, wow, how'd she end up with that guy? She lost a bet. That must be what it is. Because if you've seen my wife, she is gorgeous. And look what she's got to live with. I mean, so I just imagine that they look at our situation and go, wow, she either was in a really low point in her life when she married him and was, self-esteem was bad, I don't know, but, but I feel bad for her. <laughs> so, but that's what we find happening actually here in Luke 21. Let me give you, paint a picture for you of what's going on. It's in the last days of Jesus. He is in Jerusalem at the temple And he's teaching, he's debating with the Pharisees and Sadducees and and scribes, uh, having all of these discussions. So the scribes and the Pharisees will throw something out at him uh, to try and stump him. And he'll throw something back and shut their mouths and make them feel bad. And and it's going back and forth. And in between all of this, Jesus is kind of looking up and watching the people. Now, let's stop and be realistic here. When it comes to people watching, Jesus cheats. Because he knows everyone's story. We look around and we can speculate. We can make things up or we can kind of wonder. But Jesus looks at these people and he knows their entire life story. Not only that, he knows their hearts. He cheats at this. It's not fair. But so Jesus is teaching, he's debating, and he's looking around at the people and looking at their situations and analyzing what's going on. Now, let me tell you what the space that they're in. They're at the temple. There are three courts uh, outside the temple building. And right now in this passage, they're in the outermost court. It was the, called the, courts of, the court of the Gentiles or the court of women. 
And everybody was allowed in this particular court. It didn't matter who you are, what your beliefs were, what your faith was. Uh, it doesn't, didn't matter your gender or age. Everyone was allowed into this outermost court. And near the entrance of the second court, the middle court, there were these big containers. Uh, they were metal and they were, they were narrow at the top. And then they ballooned out and were really, really large. Um, if you're from, I'm from Texas, so what I picture in my mind is a giant spittoon. You know what I'm talking about? Those of you who are old enough to remember spittoons, that's what I picture. It's, it's narrow at the top and really big, made of metal, and people would come by and put their offerings inside of these containers. There were 13 of them. And imagine if you drop a coin in a large metal container like that, what's that container going to do? going to bing, yeah, it's going to make a lot of noise, especially if you pour multiple coins into the container. And, and so that's what's going on is these people are coming by and they're, they're dropping their offering coins into these containers and it's making noise. So there's all this clanging and clatter going on at this, at this time. There are historical records that tell us that outside of this outer court, so out in the street, there were vendors who would actually make change for you to go take in and pour in. So I could take a $20 bill, and I could hand it to a guy, and the guy would give me $20 in pennies. So imagine this for a second. These guys are making change, and you would walk in with this big old bag of money and walk over to this metal container and pour your bag of coins into this container, and what is it going to do? It's going to make a ton of noise. It's going to go, you want me to do that again? No, please don't. <laughs> They're pouring all of these multiple coins in, and the reason that they had the vendors outside of the court to make change for you was so that you could walk in with a bigger bag of money. It's not that you had more money, it's that you have a bigger bag now. And so these guys would walk in trying to look big and look holier than everybody else. So they'd pour their, their coins in, and as this, the, these, they were called trumpets, as these trumpets are clanging and making all this noise because of the coins, the guys are looking up going, hey, how you doing? Hey, look how holy I am. Yeah, I know you. Yeah, how's it going? Look how holy I am. But they were showing off. They were trying to make themselves look big in front of this big audience because the court, this outer court, was constantly filled with hundreds of people. In Jerusalem, this was the place to be. And so they're showing off, they're kind of doing this, and that's what Jesus is watching. He's watching these people walk up and pour their coins into these trumpets and getting recognition for it. So that's where we pick up Luke chapter 24, verse 1. And it says this, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put two small copper coins in. Okay, stop there for just a second. I want you to understand what she's giving. These two copper coins would be, in today's day and terms, would be considered less than two pennies. We're talking maybe a cent and a half, maybe. I mean, we're talking nothing. We're talking next to nothing. Look at what he says. Verse 3. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. That's a wild statement. Jesus is telling the people, listen, she put in a penny and a half. She put in next to nothing, yet she gave more than everybody else. Because God sees the heart of the giver. God sees the heart of the giver. What's deep down inside of us. He sees that. That's your first blank. God sees the heart of the giver. It's not that he is counting the number of coins that are going into these containers. He's counting what's in the heart. Now there are a couple things that I really want you to notice first off. First off, I want you to notice, does Jesus condemn the rich? No. He doesn't say anything about the rich. He condones and uses the widow as an example, but he doesn't condemn the rich when they put their money in. Guys, there's nothing wrong with being a Christian and being wealthy. There's nothing wrong with that. 
God may have blessed you with wealth so that you can go out and bless the church and bless others. And I know in the back of your mind you're saying, oh see, hold on. Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to get into the kingdom of heaven. And that's true. Jesus did say that. But unless you read the entire passage where he says it, you're not getting the full meaning of his statement. Where does he say that? He says it in the context of the rich young ruler. You're familiar with this passage? Rich man comes up, says, Jesus, uh, what do I need to do to follow you, to get into heaven? And Jesus says, well, you've got to follow all the commandments. You've got to do this and this and this and this and this. And the rich young ruler looks at him and says, well, Jesus, I've done all of those things since I was a little bitty boy. I'm pretty holy. I'm, I've got it all together. And Jesus goes, good job. Now go sell all of your possessions and donate everything you sell and come follow me. And the rich young ruler shrinks and walks away. It's not about the amount of money in your account. It's about your heart. It's about your attitude towards your money. You see, sacrifice and generosity confronts our greed. When we are called to sacrifice and be generous... It confronts the greed that's deep down inside of us, doesn't it? It's not about how much money we have. It's not about being wealthy or poor. It's about our heart because God sees that heart. The rich can easily fall into the problem of loving their money more than they love God. And so that's what Jesus condemns when he talks about the camel going through the eye of a needle. He's talking about our hearts. Some of the godliest men I know are, in my terms, very wealthy, and they give most of it away. They live in luxury, but they give so much. It's not wrong to be wealthy. It's wrong to love your wealth more than you love God. If God called you as a rich person, as a wealthy person, if God came to you, and said, I want you to sell all of your possessions and give it to the poor and go out into the mission field, if you could not say yes, that's when you have a problem. But if you could look at God and say, I'll do it, then your wealth is not a problem. Your wealth is not an issue. It's not a sin. There's nothing wrong with having money. God may have blessed you with that. Just make sure that your heart about your money and your possessions is correct. But let's be honest, even the poor have the same problem, don't they? I I don't have a whole lot of money. I'm a pastor. Come on. (laughs) I don't have a whole lot of money, and I never will. But if God came to me and said, I want you to sell everything you own and give it to the poor and go do something for me, this name something, I'm going to be honest with you, I would struggle with that. I would. It's not a rich thing. It's not about being wealthy or poor. It's about our hearts. It's about the state of our heart and our attitude towards our money and possessions. So let's look at the widow for a second. Because he really uses her as an amazing example about how we should live and how our attitude should be about our money and possessions. Let me give you a little background about the way widows were treated back in this day and time. Widows and orphans were the poorest of the poor. That's why the Bible over and over talks about providing and loving for the widows and orphans that are around you. In Jesus' day and time, if you were a widow, you had no way of making money or taking care of yourself. Because women could not hold jobs the way men could hold jobs in that day and time. And so they could beg, but that was about all they could do to bring income in. So unless they had a child, specifically a son, who would take them in and take care of them, most widows lived on the street. And they had no means of taking care of themselves unless somebody took pity on on them. So this widow, according to what Jesus says, and Jesus knows her entire life story, doesn't he? Jesus looks at this widow and says... Wow, she gave more than everybody gave. Because she didn't give out of her abundance, she gave out of what she had to live on. He knew exactly what she was getting, giving. You see, when I get a check in the mail, when most of us get a check in the mail, 
we get excited about the number of zeros on that check, correct? You know, if it's a couple of zeros, we're like, all right, great, this is, this is nice. We see three zeros. I don't know about you. I see three zeros. And I'm like, yes, sweet. We're going out tonight. But if we see zeros, the number of zeros determines how excited we get about that check, correct? Because that's the way we're wired. But guys, God doesn't care about the zeros. God cares about the sacrifice. God does not care about the number of zeros that you put in an offering box or that you give to someone. God cares about the sacrifice that you're giving. God cares about your generosity. Because what have we been teaching for this entire month? We've been teaching that God owns everything on this earth. He does not need your money because he's got all of it. God can do more with that penny and a half that the widow gave than the rich man who gave hundreds of thousands of dollars right before her. Because that's the way God works. God doesn't care about the numbers. God cares about the sacrifice. You see... God smiles on the sacrifice of the giver. God smiles on the sacrifice of the giver. It's okay. Be generous. He gives you permission to be generous. When I was a young man, well, I am a young man. When I was a younger man in my college days, wow. When I was in college, I owed tons of money to tons of people. I had multiple credit cards that had thousands of dollars on them. Uh, I had student loans. I had this. I had that. And so I thought, in my young ignorance, I thought that my obligation was not to give to the church or to help people. My obligation was to pay my debt. That's what I thought. I thought, you know, I've got all this debt. I, my first responsibility is to take care of that debt. And I heard a preacher one, da- one da- time preaching on generosity say, it's okay God gives you permission to be generous. It doesn't matter your circumstances or what you owe. God gives you permission to be generous. And that changed me. That changed the way I thought. Because the sad truth is that in that day and time, when I was a young college student, the sad truth is that I wasn't giving to the church, but I wasn't paying my debts either. And I sure wasn't giving up any of the luxuries that I was paying for. I had the highest cable package you could get. I had the fastest internet that you could get back in that day and time. It was dial-up, but it was the fast one. (laughs) I went out to the movies at least once a week, and I went out to eat all the time. I was not giving up. I was not sacrificing. It wasn't that I was paying my debts and trying to be responsible. It was that I was selfish, It was all about me. Generosity had not even come across my plate yet. It hadn't even crossed my mind. I was a selfish, scum-sucking pig sinner, as Chad would say. I almost messed that up at Saturday night. That would have been bad. But that's one of those phrases you don't want to mess up. (laughs) Turning in my resignation, sorry. But... My selfishness, my self-centeredness and thinking that the world was all about me was all that I thought. And so I was not generous. I did not pay my debts. I was not responsible for my money. And I got in a lot of trouble. I went to jail because of my financial irresponsibility. That's my skeleton in the closet. Because I was not responsible. I was not generous. I was an idiot about it. I went to jail. As a result of not paying my debts and not being generous. And then God changed me. God changed the way I saw things. You see, God does not accept our excuses. God does not accept any of our excuses. And and let's think about some of the excuses that we as Christians throw out to not be generous. The first one is something we hear all the time. You know, if I had more, I would give more. That is a bold-faced lie. Because think about it for a second. If you have, get a paycheck and you get a raise, and your paycheck increases $100, let's say, what are you really going to do with that extra $100 every paycheck? Are you going to give it? No. 
If you were not generous before, you're not going to be generous with it now. Because that extra $100 comes in, what are you going to do? Oh, I can afford to uh, go out to the movies ever so often now. Oh, I can afford to do this or that. I'll be generous when my paycheck goes up $200. $200 more later, what happens? Oh, $200 more per paycheck. Now I can finally get rid of my clunker and buy a decent car, a Lexus, or a Land Rover, or a Hummer. That'd be awesome. So what do we do when we get more money? We start dreaming about the ways that we can spend our money, right? I used to dream about, man, if I won the lottery, here's how I would divvy that money up. Of course, I don't play the lottery, so I don't know why I thought that. But anyways, but we're not wired that way. Guys, if you're not generous with a little, you're not going to be generous with a lot, That's the way we're wired. If you get more in your paycheck, you're just going to find a new way to spend it on yourself. Because that's the way we are. And so think about it. If you're not being generous now, if that's the excuse that you're making, it's not a real excuse. God does not accept that excuse. The second excuse is, well, you know, I don't trust the church enough to give. I don't trust the church enough to put money in their offering boxes. Okay, now, let me be honest. If you don't trust the church enough to give to it, then why are you here? Why are you listening to what I say? If you don't trust me, why are you here listening to me right now? I mean, that is a whole break in your personal philosophy that does not match up at all. So if you don't trust us, then there's a bigger, deeper problem than what I'm talking about here today. But let's look at Calvary. I'm going to toot our horn just a little bit. Because let's think about Calvary and what Calvary uses its money for. What does Calvary do? We go out and we spend it on the community and we love on people in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you don't know that, go look at the fruit that comes out of every one of the members of this church. As we go out and empower people to do great things in the name of Jesus. We do teacher appreciation We go and do repairs at the schools during the summer. We go out and love on kids on Main Street on Halloween night. We are constantly going out and finding ways to use our money in a way that glorifies God. And what do we see as a result of it? We see life change. If you haven't seen the life change, then you've got your eyes closed. And you're refusing to see it. Because God's doing some amazing things. I'll also tell you that we give more to missions and people going out and doing mission work in the world than any church I've ever been a part of in my entire life. This church gives more to missions than almost any church in the state of Arizona. That's how much Calvary gives to missions. Because we want to see the world changed for Christ, not just Havasu. Because we spend a lot of money in Havasu... But we want to see the world changed in the name of Jesus Christ. And if there's someone out there doing that, we're going to support them. And guys, if you're still dealing with trust, guys, I'll tell you right now, this church has more accountability in the way it allows their people to spend the money than any church I've ever been a part of. When I write a che- or when I use my card or spend any money that's church money, I have to keep a receipt, and that receipt is reviewed by at least four people before it's approved. There are people, there are backups to the backups to the backups to make sure that we are not using our money irresponsibly, that we're using our money in a way that glorifies God and is furthering his kingdom. So if you still don't trust our church, there are bigger issues, and if you need to talk to us, call us. We'll show you the books. We've got nothing to hide. We want you to trust us. And so that's one of the excuses, and I'll be honest, God doesn't accept it. And the last excuse is when we hear, well, God's not blessing me, so I'm not going to give right now. (laughs) And let me, (laughs) some of you know where I'm going with this. (laughs) Let me be honest here, think about it. If you're not using what God has given you right now, why would he bless you more? You're not even using the little he has given you right now in this moment. Why would he give you more? Think about the illustration from two weeks ago. We had a water container up here. 
and it had a spigot on it. And, and he had a water bottle, and he, you know, the water bottle was God's blessing, and he was pouring it into our lives. And then what happens? We get full, and what does God do with the blessing? He pulls back until we open the spigot and pour the blessings out to others so that we can make more room in our life for God to pour more blessings in. If you're not being blessed right now, there may be a good reason for that. So you need to do an evaluation. You need to examine your life and see what is it that I'm not doing that is preventing God from pouring blessings into my life. Now, just like what was said two weeks ago, let me just preface this by saying, guys, this is not a financial investment plan. This doesn't mean that, oh, well, if I give $100, God's going to give me $300 back as long as I give. That's not the way it works. God's going to bless you in many ways. It may be financial. It may be something else. And honestly, we shouldn't be seeking after the temporary physical blessings like money and health. We need to be finding and seeking the eternal blessings that are going to go with us for eternity in heaven. We need to go out and seek the blessings of helping a person come to know Jesus Christ, to leading a person into that life change and getting to see the reward in heaven as a result. That's the kind of blessings we should be seeking after. And so God's not going to listen to our excuses because those who are giving excuses to give more for not to give more are simply looking for ways to give less. If you're sitting here thinking and processing in your mind, okay, what excuse, what can I think of, uh, what, what way can I fathom in my mind to justify not giving more? In reality, you're just saying, I just don't want to be a generous person. I'd rather be a Scrooge. I'd rather keep it all to myself. That's what you're saying. God doesn't want your excuses. He wants your sacrifice and your generosity. You see, generosity is a direct sign of a person's trust in God. It is a direct reflection of a person's trust in God. And we have seen that here at Calvary in a very real way just three or four weeks ago. Um, We had a young lady who's been coming for a little while, and she moved here from California and and was coming out of a divorce situation where the ex-husband was violent and was trying to find her, uh, to physically harm her. And so she had to leave California uh, and seek refuge somewhere. And so she ended I don't know why she ended up in Havasu. But anyways, she ended up here. And she ended up here at Calvary. And because of the divorce and the separation, her finances were shot. They were done. They, she was barely getting by. She was barely making her bills. She was struggling. And she sat in the back in one of the services and she felt God on her heart saying, I want you to be generous. I want you to give. And so she, middle service, opens up her purse, pulls out her wallet, pulls out $30. It's all she had in her wallet. It's all she had to her name. She pulls that $30 out and the guy next to her, one of her friends, looks at her and says, what are you doing? That's your money to live on. God doesn't want you to give that. Put that back in your purse and take care of yourself this week. She goes, no, 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 it's okay. You know, I need to give this. I've been putting money back to go back to California and see my family, whom I haven't seen in a long time since all of this started. And I need to go to California, but God's going to take care of it. Don't worry. It'll be fine. So she goes and gives the $30, puts it in the offering box. She wakes up Monday morning, puts the keys in the car, turns, nothing happens. Her car's broken down. And the money she had to live on is now negative because she has to go and get her car fixed. So she takes it and finds out that the repairs that have to be done on her car is going to wipe out all the money that she had been saving to go to California. And so she pays the money and gets her car fixed. And Tuesday she gets up, goes through her day, and she has life group that Tuesday night. So she goes to life group that night. She takes her friend with her, and unbeknownst to her, her life group for a couple of weeks has been collecting money from everybody in their life group to send her to California. And that day, they put in her hand enough money to fix her car, send her to California, and have spending money while she's there. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that's a coincidence? No. 
God knew she was going to give that $30 that weekend. God knew that her car was going to break down. And God knew that that life group was going to provide for her. Because God acted on her willingness to sacrifice and be generous. Not only did she have enough money to fix the car, go to California and have spending money while she was there, her friend who was with her who had told her not to give the $30 was at that life group meeting and walked out completely changed because he saw something in the church that he had never seen before. Talking to her, she said, my friend had to reevaluate everything he had thought about church and everything he thought about Christians. She experienced life change because of sacrifice and generosity. And God had it all planned out. If we will simply stop making the excuses and trust God, that's what it takes. So that's my question. Are you making excuses or are you trusting God today? Are you making excuses or are you trusting God? I made excuses for years and years and years and I got in trouble for it. And now I'm not because I'm not making the excuses anymore. But think about what I've said today. God sees the heart of the giver and he smiles on the sacrifice. But he does not accept our excuses, so trust him. So what excuses are you making today? What ways are you not trusting him? Join with me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you so much for this morning. And Lord, we pray, our desire, our heart this morning is to learn to be sacrificial, to be generous, to give in the way that you have called us to give, to help others, to provide for others, to love on others through the resources and the time that we have. Lord, help us to be a people that give, to give generously and to give sacrificially the way you've called us to live. Help us to live a little more like Jesus. Thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity. And God, we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please stand. Let's worship.